Hola amigos, bien o okay. qué? Bienvenido otra vez aquí desde Medellín. Um, entonces hoy poco cambio el tema. Ese es uh, para hablar un poco, como usted sabe, en las semanas pasado estoy leyendo este libro, La Estrategia Emergente. Toma este libro para practicar especialmente hablar en voz alta, para practicar la pronunciación y el sonido en total. Pero también es un tema muy interesante. Um, so ayer, finalmente, casi después de tres semanas más o menos, yo terminé leyendo este libro. Muy bien. Um, en verdad, este nivel poco complicado para mí. Es un poco más alto con mi nivel para decir um, confortable. Um, muchas expresiones muy complicado. Pero yo creo que yo entiendo más o menos en cuál el autor hablar. Por eso yo voy momentan explicar um, qué pasó en este libro. Pero también es para decir que, um, por ejemplo, para utilizar este libro para practicar la pronunciación, muy útil, porque muchas cosas para, para leer, mucho nuevo vocabulario, y también, claro, aquí tiene mucho las frases que hispanohablantes utilizan normalmente para describir cosas. Sí, eso es un nivel un poco más avanzo, avanzado que normalmente yo voy a leer, pero está bien. Creo que yo entendí en total. Pero yo, neces yo necesito tomar un, un forma para leer un poco diferente. Eso es que yo no, uh, yo no he traduciendo todas las palabras, no. Solo que yo leí una, una página, dos páginas, nota algunas palabras que son absolutas nuevas para mí, pero en verdad, normalmente yo continúo, continúo para leer, para um, entender en general el tema que están expresando. So es no, yo no puedo traducir este libro, no. Solo para mirar, ok, so más o menos yo entiendo este tema aquí, yo no, enten, yo no entiendo todas las palabras, no, pero yo entiendo el tema en total, es la diferencia. Y después, ok, también se ayuda para pensar bien con los temas del libro, tomo una, como dice, a summary uh, para qué pasó en el libro. Listo. So, um, that's to let you know what I've been doing. So about three weeks to read the book. Um, in truth, yes, the book is at a level that normally I would not read because it's quite advanced and honestly, quite a lot of new words um, and expressions as well. But it's a proper textbook kind of book. So. This takes the, the level of writing to a different level than perhaps we might use in conversation. Some of the phrases um, are quite literary. However, the practicing reading aloud, really good. Um, lots of new expressions, lots of new vocabulary, very useful. Um, what else to say? So I had to take a different approach to how I was reading and studying this particular book because it's not practical to look up every word or to try and translate the whole book. It's not practical. So what I was doing instead, I was continuing. I would read a whole page, two pages, and I would just very briefly note occasional words if they were completely new and I really didn't understand them or if I didn't understand that word, I couldn't understand the sentence. I would note those down. But the rest of it, no, I would just keep reading. Because eventually, um, what you will note perhaps in these type of books is the author's central idea normally is actually fairly 
straightforward. It's just that in common with these type of this type of writing, you have to explain it from all sorts of different points of view to deal with different arguments against each time. So you have to basically re-explain the concept several times. This again helps us because we get different ways of looking at the same topic. Um, so I found the book useful in the end. It did take a while to read, say about three weeks, um, and I had to adopt a different approach to doing it. But this is to encourage you that if you do get a book that's like a bit difficult, oh, didn't expect it to be quite this tricky, don't worry, stick with it. Continue reading as much as you can. Read like a whole page, two pages, and just at the end of the chapter, see if you can very briefly summarize what happened. What's the key idea in this chapter? Okay, that's really the exercise here. This kind of thing, particularly as we're using the books to give us um, where's well, the practice reading out loud. This is really a way for us to practice with our voice. We're, we're doing more like voice training with this, more speaking practice. That's going to help us more because we get to use words all, uh, much, much wider vocabulary than perhaps we would normally even use. That's very helpful. So stick with the reading. Just try and do a summary after every chapter or so to see how much you've really understood. Note down the odd words you think, OK, that's a really interesting one. I've never seen that word. Let's write that one down. A um, bit like that. But don't worry about It's not like a translation exercise. This is really a reading aloud exercise to see how your um, skill at reading is improving. Yeah. So to demonstrate that bit, I'm going to read the last paragraph or so in the last page of this book. So we have here, página 242. El balancing act de ser el líder de un proceso de estrategia emergente. Jim Collins habla de los líderes nivel 5, algo así como el máximo nivel en su ranking. La metáfora del líder que construye re, re, relojes precisos, no el que da la hora con precisión, combinando con el líder que es humilde a nivel personal y ambicioso con su organización. Podríamos decir que el líder que necesita la estrategia emergente es el nivel 5 de Collins y algo más. Ese algo más deviene de no verlo individualmente como una estrategia en sí mismo. La verdad, no he conocido un CEO que tenga todas estas características completamente desplegadas y en ese sentido ellos conforman un ideal muy difícil de alcanzar. Pero todos ellos unos en unos y otras en otros, y en algunos casos muchos de ellos simultáneamente, las he visto activas en los CEO más efectivos a la hora de practicar la estrategia. Hacer explícito lo que algunos de ellos hacían fue un proceso muy educativo para mí. Lo interesante es que más allá del estilo a la condición, pues los he conocido en compañías públicas, privadas, estatales y familiares, los he conocido ateos, cristianos, católicos, budistas, judíos y musulmanes, y los he conocido callados y vocales, muy emprendedores y más cooperativos grandes comunicadores, verbales y algunos poco claros, entusiastas y moderados, me he llevado a la conclu conclusión de que es lo que hacen al interior del proceso, no lo que son hoy su naturaleza. Lo que termina por determinar su efectividad como 
líderes en un proceso de estrategia emergente. Okay, so we'll stop there. So that's just to demonstrate how I've been using the book, really. So I just read paragraphs, chapters at a time, read it out loud, listen to how I sound, try and get a better feel for the expression. And obviously, as I get to odd words, I don't remember that one, I go back, note that one down, because that might be a useful word. But really, it's just keep reading, and then you can reflect on, as the, the author's taking you through his topic, usually becomes a bit clearer what he was talking about. Um, so, show you this bit. I'm going to now give my summary of the book. Here we go. So, the book we were talking about, La Estrategia Emergente, by Alejandro Salazar. So in this book, Mr. Salazar is talking about, um, initially, in, early in his career, he comes across uh, a book or an article that's written by another gentleman called Michael Porter. And this book was called What is Strategy? And this was talking about strategic plans, strategic plans that companies use to you know, decide what they're going to do in the future, um, how they're best going to perform economically. So Porter's argument looking at the strategic plan was really that um, all this ended up doing was it became like an orthodox view. So the strategic plan was something that you couldn't really um, question. Once it was established, you just had to follow the plan. And any problems um, in the performance was seen as a failure of you or the company for implementing the plan, not necessarily a problem with the plan. So it wasn't looking at the, the potential limitations of the strategic plan. Porter was wondering whether people had become blind to the fact that the strategic plan perhaps wasn't working as well as it could or should. So from this one, Salazar's reading Porter's um, argument. He thinks that's very interesting. This inspires him to do, look some other research based on companies he's been working with. And after quite a bit of research, he comes up with his new theory, which we're going to look at from now as a TEE, or Theoria de la Estrategia Emergente. He makes a parallel between um, the biosphere, as he calls it, biosfera y econosfera. So the biosphere and the e economic sphere. So he's using a lot of references with um, evolution theory, Darwinism, this kind of thing. So here he's seeing a parallel between competition in the business sense, competition for business success, in the same way that Darwin's talked about competition between different um, species in a particular environment. So where Darwin's talking about like an evolutionary niche, the specific specialism that a particular species has that makes it successful in that environment, Salazar's suggesting that the, the, um, the parallel to this in the marketplace, businesses can look at where they are in the particular market, especially when they look at who is their customer, which is essential. They have a very clear definition of who their customer is. Because once they understand their customer, they can look at what type of value they can give to their customer. And value in this sense is a thing that is separate from just the idea of lower prices. So it's not just lowering prices because value you know, is a more abstract um, idea which effectively is unlimited. And we should really think about this more perhaps in terms of things like brand loyalty. So it's not about price of the product, it's about the value this product has to your customers. So once the business has found its evolutionary niche, so the thing it's really good at which gives it success in its competition, occasionally things it's producing might produce an anomaly. So there might be something it thought it was very good at making but then customers are asking for something else or they're using the product differently, something like that. So this is what um, Salazar identifies basically as a mutation. And this again is where he goes back towards Darwinism, where in Darwinism you have a, a mutation within the species 
that then finds a new way to adapt to an environment and then succeed. So looking at the mutation as an adaptive advantage, within the, the lifespan of a company, something it's doing, perhaps um, we can call it like a mutation or something, an anomaly occurs, which if looked at properly, could be an adaptive ad advantage, which allows the company to gain more value to give back to its customers. So in this case, Salazar's theory is set up to look for these anomalies, to look for these mutations. It's a, rather than the strategic plan, which is just kind of linear, we just follow this, follow these steps, and you're scored as long as you hit the targets that are pre, um, pre set within the plan. Um, Salazar's theory is a bit different because this one is actually designed to look for potential variants mutations let's say which and then to judge these as to whether they truly have an adaptive advantage which can bring value back to the customers so to judge these mutations it's a it's a choice process so this is where the the ceo now has a different role he's not just someone that enforces the strategic plan in this case he has to look at the core business of the company realize that there's a mutation that's occurred that's separate from that core business, but take a choice, which in Salazar's case, he, he specifically terms a hard choice, as whether he should invest in this new mutation because he has the option of gaining new products, maybe new markets to bring back some value, or whether this would in fact affect the core business. So the whole system of the theory of uh, emergent strategy, or T, if you, if you like, is about how the company looks at these kind of mutations or anomalies, reframes the way they look at their business in terms of opportunities, and this is what he calls a breakthrough moment, and then by reframing the, um, the opportunity they have, or the direction they're going in, this allows them potentially to say, make new investments, look for new products, markets, and then we're back to the idea of gaining some more value. So in this case, the CEO now has a new role. His job really is just to facilitate by using the T, his, his job is to facilitate conversations amongst his company to help them make these hard choices to look at the anomalies or mutations as they occur as opportunities, not as failures of the plan, which in the past they would have been seen as because that's not something that was predicted. Instead, this breakthrough by reframing what would have originally been seen as a failure, as reframing it as an opportunity, um, the CEO's role is to help by having conversations with people to help them be more reflective and see that actually it's not just following the plan it's now there's an opportunity here to gain some new value um, so to give an example of that generally to try and show what that kind of thing is happening if we look back at something like the uh, the food or restaurant business um, recently a lot of restaurants had to close couldn't allow customers in because of the covid lockdown um, so but they also discovered that customers liked the fact that they could deliver food so the restaurants that responded best to this and were more adaptive recognized this change as an opportunity, not just shutting the restaurant, but continued trading and switched and delivered um, food, realized that they had gained new value because by delivering something, they were, they were gaining a new value to their customers, in this case, by frame of convenience. So there we go. So broadly, by taking a slightly different look at um, problems or anomalies that come up in the lifespan of a company, Salazar's shown that there's a different way you can take what otherwise might perhaps be seen as a failure of the strategic plan, but use it to your advantage to look for new value um, with your customers and hopefully gain a lot more brand loyalty in the end. So there we go. That's my summary of the book. So that will show you really the idea is when the time you finished your reading, 
even with a complicated book like that, okay, you note I didn't do this in Spanish, the summary at least, um, just to make sure, do a summary, see how much you've understood of the book. Don't worry too much if the level for you is like, that's a bit more complicated than perhaps I would have, I would have thought. Use it as a practice um, for reading out loud, because this way you get to come across a much wider range of vocabulary than you normally would use. That in itself is very helpful. You're going to start seeing more patterns of how the language fits together, um, common phrases, different types of expressions. Again, maybe these are things that we wouldn't necessarily use day to day unless we're writing a book, but it's still very useful to, uh, to practice. Um, and also this sense of summary as well is also a useful exercise. Obviously, the thing I had to get better at is being able to do this kind of summary in Spanish, but we'll see. So I'm off to give the book back to the library and I shall pick a different one um, and then we'll see how we go with that. Hopefully the next one <laughs> I should be able to do in Spanish, but we'll see. Okay, that's it for today. I hope you enjoyed the, this uh, slightly unusual video today, a bit off topic perhaps, but I um, hope you found that useful. Um, so wherever you are, have a great day and um, see you soon. Cheerio for now.